Ignace Semmelweis is known as the doctor to first prove that childbed fever was contagious and could be drastically reduced by enforcing appropriate hand-washing by medical caregivers. Rather than being applauded for his discovery, he was condemned by the medical profession and ended his life in an asylum, while his colleagues refused to acknowledge his findings. Sepsis is the cause of death in about 1,400 people each day. Such infections are the most common complications of hospitalized patients, with 5-10% to of people in acute care hospitals acquiring at least one infection. Infection control is essential in order to limit the spread of these diseases. Cross-infection of patients by the contaminated hands of healthcare workers is a major method of spreading infectious agents. Hand hygiene is known to be the single most important factor for infection control. However, this was not always acknowledged in the medical community. In the 1800s, women still routinely died of childbirth, frequently from what was termed childbed fever, also known as perperol fever, which is a form of sepsis. At the time, it was common for doctors to not wash their hands, and people still were discovering how disease and germs were spread. In fact, in 1822, 25 years before Louis Pasteur announced the germ theory, Dr. William Campbell of Edinburgh, an outspoken opponent of the theory of contagion, wrote a treat size on childbed fever. In it, he described an event in which he had assisted in the autopsy of a young woman who had died of childbed fever, and then he wrote, The same evening, without changing my clothes, I attended the delivery of a poor woman in the cannon gate. She died next morning. I went in the same clothes to assist some of my pupils who were engaged with a woman who died. He noticed that several midwife acquaintances experienced similar events, which made him think, why are all these women dying when current science says I'm doing everything right? These thoughts lingered over the next eight years till he came to the conclusion that he should not attend autopsies when he was also intending women giving birth in the following hours or days. Such was the level of ignorance concerning disease contagion, not only within the British medical community, but with physicians throughout the Western world. While Dr. Campbell eventually revised his method of practicing medicine, such was usually not the case with medical professionals. This was the world that Dr. Ignace Semmelweis was practicing in during the 1840s. While working at the Vienna General Hospital, he observed a difference in the mortality rates of the two operating maternity divisions. The first experienced mortality rates at a consistently higher level than the second for the years 1841 to 1846, despite the fact that the methods of treatment were identical. The only difference he could find was that the first was comprised of medical students who also performed daily cadaver dissections, while the second was only trainee midwives who were not touching dead bodies. During the same six years, Division I experienced infection rates consistently two to three times greater than those in the midwives' Division II. This was one of the first important truths he uncovered. In fact, even the public was aware of this difference in outcome between the two. As Semmelweis described it, the patients really do fear the first clinic. Frequently, one must witness moving scenes in which patients, kneeling and wringing their hands, beg to be released in order to seek admission to the second clinic. Because of these initial observations, he surmised that this difference in mortality rates between the two groups held an important clue to the cause of childbed fever. In response, he quietly continued his research on his own. Semmelweis extracted additional facts that he compiled into more graphs contrasting infection rates and deaths versus parity. First versus multiple deliveries, for those not aware of medical jargon. Length of labor, month of delivery, premature births, or precipitous births, before and after splitting the ward into two divisions, and so on. From there, he created 64 tables contrasting and illustrating any and all variables that might possibly be connected to infections and mortality. Some facts that he had already sensed clinically he could now confirm with statistics. Multi-Paris women, those delivering for at least the second time, with their shorter labors and more frequent precipitous births, represented a decidedly lower risk when compared to the primiparis, those women delivering for the first time. In addition, if labor lasted over 24 hours, chances of contracting perperol infection were virtually 100%. Statistics also confirmed another clinical observation. Street births, 
that is, women who delivered at home or on the street prior to being admitted to the maternity ward, also represented a lower risk. They rarely became infected compared to those at the clinic. As these facts rose to the surface during his research, Semmelweis came to one conclusion. Certain infectious factors were in play that pointed to childbed fever, especially in Division I, being a contagious disease. In other words, the disease was ever-present on the ward at a rate that fluctuated over time, but never left. However, he was still a ways off from a breakthrough explanation for what caused the disease. The breakthrough occurred in 1847, following the death of his good friend, Jacob Koletska, who had been accidentally poked with a student's scalpel while performing a post-mortem examination. Koletska's own autopsy showed a pathology similar to that of the women who were dying from puerperal fever. Semmelweis immediately proposed a connection between the two diseases. He concluded that he and the medical students carried cadaverous particles on their hands from the autopsy room to the patients they examined in the first division. This explained why the student midwives in the second division, who were not engaged in autopsies and had no contact with cadavers, saw a much lower mortality rate. This revelation did not come without ethical and emotional struggles on his part. As Semmelweis contemplated the ramifications of his discovery, he was humbled as he considered the consequences of his own prior behavior. How many thousands of times had he himself proceeded directly from the morgue to the maternity ward to examine pregnant women, most of whom were in labor? Though his mistakes were committed in ignorance, Semmelweis realized the depth of his own guilt in causing epidemics of childbed fever and offered the public the first of two mea culpas. My conscience tells me that I must reprove myself, as God only knows the number of those who have died as a result of my activity. Few of the obstetricians have had more dealings with cadavers than myself. However painful and distressing this fact is, there would be no sense in denying it. Now there is one remedy only, to publish the truth to all those who are concerned. Not only did Semmelweis publish the truth of his findings, he also set about finding a way to limit deaths from childbed fever. If his hypothesis concerning the entrance of cadaveric particles into the vascular system by merely coming into contact with genital wounds caused during childbirth was correct, then why not destroy those same particles with some sort of chemical? He was already aware that several European cities deodorized their sewage systems using chloride of lime. So Semmelweis decided that all personnel, including custodians, nurses, students, and faculty, must wash their hands in chloride of lime, including using a brush underneath the fingernails. It required less than four weeks of new mortality statistics for Semmelweis to realize that something profound had occurred. April had an 18.3% mortality, May had 12.2%, and June had only 2.4%, a drop of more than 15% in three months. By August, he recorded a month with zero infections from childbed fever. His experiment was a success. His reason was sound. And yet this wasn't a triumph. His boss, who didn't quite understand the whole theory when it was explained to him months before, and yet had agreed to the hand-washing, appeared unmoved by the dramatic decrease in mortality rates. As a result, his boss could not be counted on for help defending this discovery. Despite mathematical and evidence-based proof, others in the medical profession disbelieved Semmelweis' findings. In an unfortunate case of human pride, his ideas were rejected by the medical community because some doctors, for instance, were offended at the suggestion that they should wash their hands, feeling that their social status as gentlemen was inconsistent with the idea that their hands could ever be unclean. As a result, Semmelweis' innovations were discontinued at the clinics and he was removed. Deaths by childbed fever skyrocketed back to their previous levels within a month. This did not phase Semmelweis. In 1848, despite all these rejections, he widened the scope of his washing protocol to include all instruments coming in contact with patients in labor, and use mortality rates time series to document his success in virtually eliminating childbed fever from the hospital ward that he then worked in. But still, the medical community continued to reject his theories well into the early 1860s, when he'd present at conferences and wrote books on the subject. 
It is also unclear if the overwork and stress of fighting a losing battle against the establishment contributed to his mental decline. Some have also suggested Alzheimer's as a reason, or even third-stage syphilis, a then-common ailment for obstetricians who examined thousands of women at clinics, which one can easily imagine transmitted when obstetricians don't wash their hands. When asked why so little medical history is published in the modern day, physician and writer Lewis Thomas once said it was because the behavior of the characters in the narrative is so pathetically bad. The story of childbed fever illustrates his point. Semmelweis' saga demonstrates that when a given group, including doctors, learns some set of facts, those facts too often become immutably ingrained in the minds of that group. Then, tragically, when a valid revolutionary scientific discovery comes along, that group is either unable or unwilling to accept it, to the detriment and death of thousands. Thank you for watching. Leave a comment or subscribe if you so desire. There's always more history.